Good morning, church. Okay, we can do better. We can do better. Because we have done better. Good morning, church. See? Told you you could do better. Fantastic. We're glad to see you this morning. Glad that you're here. Know that it's a little cold today, but it's January. It'll get better come about April, May, June, somewhere in that neighborhood. It'll get, it'll get here. But we're glad that you're here. Hope that you had a good week. Hope that everything is well with you and yours. I want to talk this morning about a lesson entitled, By His Blood. There was a man one time that he'd heard a preacher preaching about Jesus. And he came out and he told the preacher, he said, preacher, he said, you know, all that, that stuff about the cross and about the Jesus. He said, that's wonderful. But he said, he said, all I need is an example. That's all I need. And he said, I feel like then that, that everything will be all right and heaven will be mine. And the preacher looked at him. He said, oh, really? And he said, yeah, I really feel that way. And so the preacher looked at him. And he said, you know, Peter wrote of Jesus. It said that that he did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. And he said, how's your mouth? The man said, well, to be honest, I have a little trouble every once in a while. He said, I say some things shouldn't say, and, and I realize that. And so the preacher looked at him and said, you have a perfect example. He said, but what you need is a Savior. And then, you know, that's true of all of us. What we need is a Savior. Because none of us are perfect. None of us are individuals that live lives that d don't mess up, that d don't uh, sin. None of us. And why you say, well, you know, I see shame and I feel shame in that we should feel shame in the, in the fact that there is sin in our life. But at the same time, too, that sin can be forgiven. Jesus' mission, yea, God's purpose, was to send Jesus to this world with the whole idea of saving mankind from his sins. And when Jesus came, his very father, his earthly father, his physical father was told that he will save his people from their sins, talking about Jesus. Jesus came, and as he fulfilled that mission here upon the earth, as he died upon the cross, as he gave his last gasp, and some of his last words were, it is finished, and more than likely talking not only about his physical death, but also he had completed the mission which God had sent him for. He realized that he had done exactly what God had wanted him to do. Maybe not necessarily from a physical standpoint what he wanted, maybe from a physical standpoint not what he would have imagined or even had found pleasure in, but yet knowing that that was necessary. He fulfilled the mission that God had given him to fulfill, and that was the salvation of mankind. And so the Hebrew writer reminds us that Jesus is the great sacrifice for all of us. And going back then into the Old Testament, God always required blood. A blood sacrifice was to be given by the children of Israel each year for their sins in order to have their sins rolled forward. And then when it came to the cross, the bloodiest of all scenes, in which our Savior died upon a cross between two thieves. Savior that died not because of his sins, not because of what he had done. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us that he did not sin. But because, as Ken so correctly said in his prayer at the table, because of our sins, we find out that we have a uh, we should have a love for God because God loved us enough to send Jesus, and Jesus loved us enough to die for us. But it's by his blood that the hope that we now have before us, that hope that we call heaven, that hope of eternal life with him, that hope of spending eternity hand in hand with fellow Christians, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, to spend eternity before the very throne of God, to spend eternity worshiping our God, to spend eternity hand in hand with fellow Christians and to enjoy the pleasures and the fruits of, the, of the, not just of our labors, but of his labors and the fruits of heaven itself. She calls us to want to shout with joy, to shout with, with great pleasure, to shout with great excitement, but yet knowing as well but it's not because of us. It's not because of what we've done, but it's because of the blood of Christ. It's because Christ shed his blood, because Christ died on the cross for us, that that eternity 
is possible. But what does his blood do? What, what does his blood do for us? You see, the Bible very plainly tells us that by Christ's blood, there are certain things, certain blessings that have come our way. But what are those blessings? Well, the first one is justification. We've been justified by his blood. Paul would tell us and remind us of that in Romans chapter 5. But before he reminds us of that, he reminded us of one thing in Romans chapter 3. All have sinned. <laughs> but then we, <clears throat> we ask ourselves, well, what, what's sin? Sin, there's three basic words that are used in the Bible that talk about sin. There's, first of all, there's transgression. The word transgress is the idea of rebellion, to rebel. <clears throat> we rebel against God. You might say, preacher, I don't rebel against God. Every time you sin, you rebel against God because basically you're saying, I don't want to listen to you. I want to do what I want to do. You're rebelling. You see, we understand the idea of rebelling, those of us that, that had teenagers growing up in, a, in our households. Suzanne and I have often said, Ethan was very easy. We didn't have rebellion. We actually didn't have rebellion till Ethan went off to college. You might say, well, that's unusual. I know. He became a vegetarian for a whole year. That was his rebellion. That was, that, that was as hard as we had it. But some of you have had it much harder. But when we sin against God, we rebel against God. And so sin is transgression. But also the Bible uses the word iniquity when it talks about sin. What does the word iniquity mean? It means, it means twisted or a twisted transaction. It's literally the idea of twisting something, maybe twisting a rope, a string, twisting. We twist. What God has told us. We twist what he has taught us to live and how he's taught us how, how to do. We twist it to fit our own needs and our own wants and our own ways to twist it to our satisfaction. And then the Bible uses the word sin. What's sin? Well, literally, the Greek word is the word harmartia. It's actually martia, which is the idea of mark. But then the what's called the alpha prohibitive. In other words, if it's just like English. Sometimes you put an A in front of the word. It makes it a negative. It makes it no. And so it's not hitting the mark. It's missing the mark. So sin is missing mark. Missing the mark that God has set for us. Missing the mark that God has said, here's what I want. Here's what I expect. Here's what I want you to do. Here's how I want you to live. Here's what I expect of your life. And when we say, by whatever reason, in our life, that we don't do what God would have us to do. We've missed that mark. Maybe we undershot the, the target, or we overshot the target, or we shot to the side of the target. We missed the target. We've missed it. That's sin. The Bible tells us that we've all done it. But here comes our question. How can we correct that? You see, we're all, as you say, we're, we're all in need of that. We're, we're all in need of removal of the guilt. You know, okay, I've missed the mark. Okay, I've rebelled. I, I, I've done things that I shouldn't do. I need that removed. How can I have that removed? How, how, can, I, how can I get rid of it? How can I have, if you will, a clean record by being justified? You see, justification is a legal term. It's interesting the different terms as we look at them this morning. But the legal term justify is, is a legal term, and it's the idea of having your record expunged. In other words, there's nothing there. And Paul tells us in Romans chapter 5, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God the Father through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then... If that wasn't enough, while Paul was not writing in verses, Paul's writing in thoughts, but just a few thoughts down in verse 9 of the same chapter, he tells us we're justified, having been justified. We've been forgiven. Sins removed. You see, God does not want to hold sins against us. God does not want to hold the charge against us. God wants the charge to be removed. God wants the charge to be dropped. God is a God, that according to Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12, 
ready to pardon. That God says your sins and your iniquities I'll remember no more. I'm ready to pardon. I'm ready to let it go. I'm ready to, to forgive it. I'm ready to wipe the slate clean. And when you do, it's kind of interesting because if you look in Romans chapter 8, just a couple of pages over from Romans chapter 5 and Romans chapter 8, Paul makes this astounding statement. He talks about how that we've been made children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God. Well, how did we go from being, if you will, mess-ups, screw-ups, sinners, to being justified, to becoming God's children, all in one book, all in just a matter of two or three pages and two or three chapters as we have it? And the answer is found in the fact that God justifies us. But he justified us through the blood of Christ. He forgave us through the very blood that was shed for us. And so by his blood, we're justified. But by his blood, second of all, we're individuals that are redeemed. We just think about it. Thank you, Steve. We're redeemed. When we look at that, we have to understand why we needed it, what caused it, where we come from. But we understand that we are individuals that as we are, we need to be redeemed. We need the redemption that is found in Jesus Christ because of what sin does to us. Isaiah reminds us in Isaiah 59 that your sins and iniquities have separated you from God. Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2. James maybe even said it a little bit more succinctly. James says that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Did you catch the word enmity? When's the last time you looked it up? It's been a while, let me remind you. The word enmity is the idea of hatred. To be a friend of the world is to be enmity, to have hatred. Wait a minute, God cannot hate. God hates sin. He doesn't hate you. He hates the sin in your life. That sin divides you from God. That sin removes you from God. That sin removes you from this fellowship. That sin removes you, if you will, from his circle of friends. You're on the outside looking in now. You're not on the inside looking around. You're on the outside wanting in. And so you have a need. And so as we are, we're lost. As we are, we're needing hope. As we are, we're needing to be saved. But we want to be liberated. Because you see, we know that what sin does to us in dividing us is that we become servants of that sin, Romans 6. And we're addicted to that sin, whatever it may be. Now, preacher, you know, I'm, I'm not addicted. I, I don't take drugs. I don't drink. I don't gamble. You can be addicted to lying. You can be addicted to stealing. You can be addicted to just about anything this world has to offer. Why? Because addiction is the idea of really just a repeated offense that you get a high off of, whatever it may be. And we need to be liberated from that sin. We need to be liberated from that cage. We need to be let out. We need to be forgiven. We need to, to be let go. We need to be redeemed. We need to be brought back into the fellowship of God so that we're not addicted to those things that are wrong, so that we're not enslaved to those sins, as Paul calls them in Romans chapter 6. So we ask the question, how can we be redeemed? And the answer is by his blood. Colossians chapter 1. Paul would write, verse 13 and 14, that he's redeemed us by his blood and that in doing such, what did he do? He conveyed us. The word conveyed is, is an interesting word, but you think of the old King James that uses the word translate. Neither one of us really help us, but if, then when you begin to look at the text and look at it a little bit deeper, it's the idea of he has moved us into his kingdom. But how did he do that? Well, Paul said by his blood. How did he move us into his kingdom? By his blood. He redeemed us. He brought us back. We're no longer on the outside looking in. We're redeemed. Made whole again. We're liberated. 
in whom we have redemption through his blood, Paul said in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. Paul there in Ephesians chapter 1 is talking about all these spiritual blessings, all these blessings that are found in Jesus Christ. And he talks about he talks about adoption, he talks about being God's children, and he says, in whom we have redemption through his blood. You see, we've we've been bought back. We're no longer, if you will, a slave to sin, separated from God, but we've been brought bought and brought to God through Jesus Christ. And so we've been liberated from this very sin in our life, and we've been brought back to God. Stories told of Winston Churchill when he was but a lad. He was out in a pond on his family's property, and the gardener heard the boy screaming and hollering for he'd gotten in over his head and, and he could not swim. And, and so consequently, he was screaming and hollering and the gardener heard and he ran and he jumped in and he saved the boy. Winston Churchill's family was so appreciative. They said, you can have, told the gardener, you can have whatever you want. And the gardener said, well, I want my son to have college education. Done. And they did. And then they sent the boy to school. And later on, Winston Churchill got sick. And in getting sick, he needed some medicine. Some medicine that the young boy that Churchill's family had sent to school, the gardener's son, Alexander Fleming, You see, he had discovered the medicine that Churchill needed to save him from his illness. And Churchill said, rarely does a man owe his life to an individual twice. But I owe my life to Alexander Fleming. We owe our life to Jesus Christ. But it's all by his blood. It's not by us, but it's by his blood. And so by his blood, I've been redeemed. But thirdly, by his blood, I've been remitted. I have remission, remission of sins. As I am, I'm a debtor. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, when we read the Sermon on the Mount, and we read there in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 12, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Have you ever thought that strange? A debt. We think of a debt. We think of owing somebody money, right? I have a debt. I owe somebody money. Or maybe I owe them a favor because of something they, they did to me. But but as a, as a general rule, we think of debt as a financial term. Let's think a little bit further. In Jesus' day, when you did not meet an obligation of any kind, financial or otherwise, when you did not meet that obligation in Jesus' day, you were said to be indebted. You were said to have a debt. And so in Jesus' day, if, if you didn't meet an obligation towards Jesus, guess what? You were a debtor to Jesus. And so in the way of thinking, when the apostles, when the, uh, the writers, the inspired writers, when they used those words that they used, they used them through the Holy Spirit. They used them not, if you will, by choice or by chance, but by choice. They use them because those are the words God wanted. He wanted us to understand. We owe. We have a debt. And we need it removed. We need that debt answered. We need it cleared. We need it removed so that it is gone. And it is no more. Great example of, of this very idea is found in Matthew chapter 18, where the Lord is teaching the idea of forgiveness. Remember the, the slave that owes his masters what we would account to as millions of dollars? And he goes to, to the master because the master is about to sell him and at least get something back. And he says, he says just hold on, give me an opportunity, and, and I'll, I'll pay you what I can. I'll pay you what I owe you. And so the master forgives him of his debt. That very same servant goes out and he finds another servant that would owe him just a couple hundred dollars, just, just a few dollars, just pennies, if you will, in comparison to what he owed. 
And he grabs him by the throat and he strangles him. And he says, give me my money. He says, can't. He says, be patient with me. Surely the words of his fellow slave is ringing in his ears. But for whatever reason, he doesn't stop. And he has the man thrown in prison, debtor's prison. And the master comes and he hears the first slave and he tells him, he says, hey, I hear what you've done. He said, "You basically, to paraphrase what Jesus teaches, he says, you wanted forgiveness, but you were not willing to forgive. And so he takes him and he calls him into account. As individuals, we need to remember. We've been called into account. And so as I am in my need, I need my debt removed because as a sinner, I, I have fallen short. And my debt is great. And I need it removed. And God answers that and he says, your debt's removed by the blood of Christ. As Jesus instituted the, the Lord's Supper that we so call it, that we partake upon the first day of every week as they did in the early church. Do you remember Jesus took the bread and he blessed it, broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. But do you remember what he said about the cup? When he took the cup, he gave thanks. And he gave it to him saying, drink all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which was shed for many for the remission of sins. The word remission is the idea of a removal of a debt. You see, by his blood, our debt was removed. That's why in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, when Peter stood up and preached the first gospel sermon, <clears throat> when he told them, basically about Jesus Christ. And he led them to understand that that very Jesus that God had sent to be the Savior of the world, they crucified. And they asked, what must we do? But they asked what they must do because they were pricked in their hearts. You want to go off into that study, come back tonight. But Peter told them, repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, the removal of your sins, the removal of the debt. What a great thought. To think that by his blood I have the remission of sins that is mine. I've been bought back. I've been not only bought back, but I have been redeemed by his blood. I have been an individual that is justified, forgiven of my sins by the very blood of Christ. But by his blood, I've been reconciled. <clears throat> when you think about the idea of reconciliation, what do you think about? Well, you know, we talk about maybe reconciling our bank statement at the end of the month. Well, what are we trying to do? We're trying to get both sides where they agree. Bank side, my side, where they agree, where we see each other and say, yep, yep, that's that's how much I don't have. <laughs> but at the same point in time, too. Reconciled is the idea of taking two friends that are estranged and bringing them back together. You've probably got friends in your life that you haven't seen in years, and it's not because you don't like them. It's not because you don't agree with them. It's because distance and time have, have changed things. And you're not able to see them very often. But there's folks that are probably, through the years, been your friends that are living in the very same place that they were then. Or if they've moved, they didn't move very far away. Maybe it's because they said something to you, or maybe it was because they did something, or maybe it was because they said something to somebody else about you, but for whatever reason, you became estranged between the two of you. And the divide grew stronger, and it grew wider, to the point where not only do you not talk to one another, you don't send notes to each other, you definitely don't send Christmas cards because postage is too expensive to send. You don't call them every once in a while because, after all, you don't have the time and you don't know what they might be doing. And after all, you really don't want to talk to them. Why? Because of the way they treated you, because of the way they did you. And so you no longer have fellowship with them. As we are with God when we sin, 
the very same thing happens. When we sin, we pull ourselves away from God. Now, mind you, God has not moved. Mind you, God is still where he was. He hasn't moved. He hasn't left. But in our sin, we have removed ourselves, and we are no longer in fellowship with him. And as Paul would write in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, that light has no fellowship with darkness, that God has no fellowship with darkness, that God has no friendship with darkness, that God in being friends with those that are in darkness, it's not possible. As a sinner, guess what? We're in darkness. For darkness in the Bible is portrayed as is portrayed as those that are sinners, those that are lost, those that are not walking with the Lord. But by his blood we're reconciled. Well, what does that mean? And and preacher, the, does the Bible really teach that we can be reconciled? Oh, yes. In Ephesians chapter two. Paul begins that chapter by talking about what things those brethren at Ephesus had done in the past. How they walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, and who were by nature. The word nature there does not mean inborn nature or habit, but it is the idea of habit. Who were by habit. Children of the devil, prince of the power of air. And then Paul goes on to talk about, in Ephesians chapter 2, he talks about that God who is rich in his mercy with his great love, wherewith he loved us, where we and we were dead in our sins, Christ raised us together with him. For by grace have you been saved through faith. And then beginning in verse 8 and going through verse 10, Paul talks about that grace. And he talks about that grace being God and God's working and God's giving to us. For by grace have you been saved through faith and not because of you, but because of God. And then he begins in verse 11. He talks about those that were far off. He talks about those of you that were without Christ. Strangers. From the covenant of promise, having no hope, and you were without God. But then he says in verse 13, you've been brought now nigh or near. You see, you were away from God. You were far from God. But you've been brought near to God. How did we, how did we get there? How did we get near to God? By the blood of Christ. How did we get to be in God's fellowship? How did we get to be in God's camp? How did we get to be on God's side? How did we get to be friends with God again? By the blood of Christ. And so by his blood, we've been reconciled. So that we are his children. We, are, we have been brought to him. It's much like the little boy that was in the hospital and he had received a diagnosis a diagnosis in which he would not get out of the hospital. As he lay there one day, he realized that on one side of the bed was his mama and on the other side of the bed was his daddy. And he knew that his mama and daddy hadn't got along, had lived in the same house, had been estranged for a, few, or a while. and So he asked both of them for their hands. And so he took their hands as he laid in that bed and he put their hands together, and he said, now work it out. Christ, through his blood, took the hand of God and took our hand and brought us together and said, now, get it right. And so by his, by his very actions, by his blood, I've been reconciled. But by his blood, we're individuals that were cleansed. Sin dirties us. The result of sin is to be dirtied. The result of sin is to be individuals that are impure. Paul would write in Titus chapter 1, verse 15, that we're defiled by the very actions of sin. 
And so what we need is to be cleansed and what we need is to be made whole and be made pure. And it's by the blood of Christ. It's by the very blood that Christ shed upon the cross that I've been cleansed. And so John would write in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins. You ever gotten dirty? Well, sure, preacher, I've gotten dirty. No, no, I'm talking about dirty, dirty. You know, we all get dirty every day, oils and things in our skin. But have you ever just gotten really dirty? Maybe you've gone outside and you, you played in the dirt when you was a kid. Maybe you, you still do it. It's called gardening. You know, there's the difference in children and, and adults, right? The difference between children and adults, children go play in the dirt. Adults do too. Adults just garden. Uh, we get dirty. And you come in, you have to wash soap and water and scrub. And when you're a child, you know, mom found every crevice and corner in your body and she scrubbed it till there wasn't any more skin. You couldn't get dirty more. You didn't have any more skin. But nevertheless, you were clean. You were deemed fit to go to church the next day. In our sin, we need to be cleansed. We need to be made whole. By his blood, he cleansed us. By his blood, he washed us. And by his blood, he continues to wash us. For we may say, as John would say in 1 John chapter 1, we may say we have no sin. John says, we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth's not in us. But John also told us in 1 John chapter 1, if we walk in the light, as he's in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Christ cleanses us continues to cleanse us, continues to keep us clean, continues to sanctify us, continues to make us whole. So I'm cleansed by the blood of Christ. No more to be spotted and stained by the old marks of sin, but to be made whole and to be made clean by the very blood of Jesus Christ. Preacher, I don't understand how blood makes anything clean. Blood does not clean anything. It stains I know, but I don't have to know how. I just got to know that it does. I don't know how paint sticks to a wall. I just know that it does. And so every once in a while, my wife says, paint. And so I say, yes, ma'am. I don't have to understand how my car works to understand that I can go out there and start it, put it in drive, and it'll go. I don't have to understand how blood can cleanse me. All I have to understand is that it does. As Paul uses the analogy of the husband and the wife with regards to Christ and the church, he said, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. We'll continue reading. That he might sanctify and cleanse it, washing water by the word. That he might present it to himself pure, chaste, You see, you have to ask yourself, who's the church? I'm the church. You're the church. We're the church. In his blood, he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And we're made free. We're made whole. We're forgiven. We're individuals that stand pure, that stand justified by his blood. Dear friends, you didn't do it by yourself. And you can't save yourself. But the blood of Christ can. This morning, if you're not a New Testament child of God, or you're an individual that needs to to rededicate your life, ask for the prayers of the church, don't you want to be redeemed? Don't you want to be reconciled? Don't you want to be justified? Don't you want to be made whole? If you have need of the invitation, let the blood of Christ touch your life. All together we stand and sing.